Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's FPV podcast. This week, we have a great bunch of guys representing yeah. Team Flow Rotors. We met them at Dover, met one of them right. at Multi GP International Open. We're going to get to talk Ooh. a lot about frames, about racing, and all sorts of stuff involving this nice little community. So, before we introduce them, Elvin, say hello to everyone. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. Uh, we are we going to interview Flow Rotors, man. We, we we had some good time with them in Dover, so this should be fun. This should be a good good podcast. Everybody sit down and kick your feet up and relax a little bit. Maybe thumb through the pulse, uh, you know, battery selection and off a heli direct and then uh, buy something. But uh, chill out, man. We're going to have some fun. All right, there's your plug, and here we go. Right. Flo, why don't you start us off with your team? Hey, how you doing? Uh, so this, uh, we got uh, two guys here on the team. They're uh, excellent racers here. We got Richard Kennedy as Rambozo FPV and Aldo Padilla as uh, TELUS. And uh, these guys are the best in the business right now. So I'm very, very excited to be doing this, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, I met you guys over at Dover, like you said, Elvin, and uh, we kicked it right off. So, right, pretty cool. Good to have, good to see you again, Flo. Aldo, next, what you got? Well, uh, Team Flo Rotors. Uh, I, um, I'm also sponsored by uh, Stay Up FPV. That is Jakey Betta's uh, component company, uh, based out of Southern California. And I've been with Flow Rotors uh, for quite a while now. I'd like to say coming up on a year, maybe. No, no, no. Maybe a little uh, more. And you're you you're yeah, the manager right. of the team, right? You're you're manager of team Flow Rotor, right? No, no, no. Oh, I, I, oh, maybe I messed that I was, up. Uh, I was pit boss at uh, pit the boss, Dover pit race. Boss. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Handing out the walkie talkies and not, thinking not, of strategies. Don't need to get on anybody's you know, position. <laughs> that's still he leadership it, spot. By the way. Yeah, that's, the best, that's leadership. It. We had the best pit times that entire weekend. Yeah, consistent, consistent pit times. Oh, yeah. You we guys practiced really, it. really. I, I watched the other teams was paying attention to when y'all was practicing. All right. Like, oh, Stop shit. jumping ahead. Stop <laughs> jumping ahead. <laughs> Richard. We like these guys, man. We have fun with these guys. That's yes, what, we do. But we got to introduce them first. Yeah. Richard, yeah. say hello <laughs> before <laughs> Elvin come on, come on. takes Just over. Just for the record, they start copying our, our, uh, you know, our way of doing things for the pit stops and changing yeah. out, swapping batteries and everything. And yeah. the uh, by the third day, everything leveled out. You know, the team started figuring out how to do things. So. We'll Everybody went that. to Walmart the next day and picked up a <laughs> pair of walkie talkies. And, um, you know, a, a lot of the things that you feel are pretty basic, but you don't think of them at the moment. Right. Um, Look at these what, guys. But, but we're getting ahead of ourselves, right? right so right, competitive. Right, right, right. I can't even Go get some, a word wise. Richard, you're in trouble. You're just going to be like, know, knocked out. We got some serious talkers in here today. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to say before you move on, Richard? <laughs> yeah. <I'm> just, <laughs> Is that all he had to say? I'll, I'll add, uh, I think, uh, Elvin, I think you and I share some sponsors. I got uh, FPV Direct. Oh, shocky now. That's a good crew. And I got, yep. uh, I like their Pulse batteries. And uh, I just uh, just picked up a T-Motors sponsorship. We're super Ooh. happy about that. Psyched about that. Ooh, yeah, nice. Those are nice. Them, them the good motors. I mean, we yeah. all want we all want to be sponsored by T Motor, but you know, <laughs> it's because of the price. I mean, they're the most versatile <laughs> motors. Yeah, those get, motors are sweet. Their size, uh, right? I mean, Luke ever comes in on this conversation. He's also on T Motors as well, and yeah, he's yeah. got his own Spook Edition twenty two oh six, I believe. Oh, so he's nice. killing it out there with those. Nice. nice. There we go. So our last member, he's MIA currently. Maybe he'll join us a little bit later. But Spook, wherever you are, hope you're having fun. But we're going to continue yeah. on with the show. So let's slap go ahead good. Good, and get slap a little bit slap back. Will you stop it. Let's go ahead <laughs> and start talking a little bit about each person's background. Flo, how'd you get into FPV or racing or drones in general? Well, it uh, all happened uh, maybe three years ago. I started, uh, about four years ago, I started a job and one of my coworkers was into 3d helicopters and me with a background of nitro cars and 
electric buggies and everything, the racing scene back like 15 years ago, off-road racing, especially, uh, you know, really into the whole RC thing and being an engineer and all that. I really liked working on these trucks and engines and tuning them and making sure they run right. And obviously the racing, I'm very competitive, having a, a skiing and skateboard background, all that. I really liked the whole things and, and racing your own product. So I got into these three helicopters and about six months later, FPV came out. And I was like, what? You can wear goggles and see exactly what this thing is seeing? That is beyond everything that's on the market right now. Right. Little, you know, a little setup, got into it, and eventually I just dropped three helicopters and I was just like, you know what, quads are the future. So I got into that and it all started from there. You know, you start small and start going bigger and bigger and bigger, and you go from brushed motors to brushless motors to custom frames and building your own, own, all that. And then racing eventually came up maybe, I don't know, six months to a year later it's been mm -hmm. a couple of years and we got into a good team with a safety third racing out of new jersey the tri-state area eric all chang that. right that, that's eric chang's group original group yeah eric chang uh uh uber frames all that yep. yep good friends with him and uh the whole safety third crew is great they've had some great feedback for everything from uh you know racing styles and working with multi gp to set up how to race to how to design a frame and what everybody wants, all that. So, Pretty cool, pretty cool. Now, let me ask you a question before you move on to the next person. Would you say that buggy racing, especially on the high end, is more expensive than drone racing? Well, you know, back in the day, there weren't all these 3D printers, and now I hear that you can 3D print arms or uh, whatever they call it now, you know, like turnbuckles, arms, all that, the... the uh, all the components on these buggies and all the cars and everything you can you can 3d print now and design and cut all these things out of carbon fiber and make out of plastic back in the day you had to go drive a hundred hobby shop to go pick yep. up a spare set of arms or yep. a spare set of tires glue your own tires put the foam inside all that so it was pretty expensive back in the day definitely especially you know 15 years ago it was a little bit younger didn't have a job, all that. So it was definitely a challenge. It was fun, and that's what kept me in it, kept me in the hobby. Nowadays, you can find quad parts all over the internet. You can mm -hmm. make your own, you put your stuff together. You can go to Amazon, buy whatever you want. So it's changed Even from a little bit. Rotors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> Pretty cool. Cool. Good opinion on that. All right, Aldo, how'd you get into FPV, drone racing, et cetera? Oh, Richard. Richard. I talk too much. Okay, Richard. Are you gonna? Are you gonna let me go first? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Richard. It's you, Richard. It's your what turn, Richard. What a guy! What a guy! All right. Um, I think I think it's a pretty common thread with most people in FPV. They came from some sort of action sports background. I, I as a kid, I grew up in Kansas riding uh, motocross. And uh, you don't break bones with FPV, that's for sure. That's the truth. That's the truth. Yeah, you don't get knocked you know, unconscious that often. You, you know all about rap, rap. You still, you still, that's true. That's a good point, though. You still get the sound. You get that screaming, yeah, that screaming engine sound. Yeah, that, that um, two-stroke scream. That's it. And then after that, I moved on to um, skateboarding too. I did that for quite a while, as you know, when I was younger. But um. I actually, RC for me started after my kids got old enough that, you know, they were pretty independent and uh, I started looking for a hobby and I always wanted to fly RC planes and I found, uh, ran into flight test on, on YouTube and I was like, oh man, these things are affordable. <laughs> so I, I, <laughs> I got into that, started making foam planes. I did that for about two years and I saw I saw FPV coming out. I was watching. I was paying attention to the to how it was sort of evolving and progressing. And I I honestly kind of kind of ignored it for a while. I was like, I don't know. I'm kind of happy just flying planes. This is cool. I mean, and it, the the expense was kind of in prohibitive too. So, mm -hmm. well, you crash um, a plane, you got to fix the whole thing and build it right up again. Yeah, but it's a three dollar plane, so 
<laughs> it's a foamy. It's not that big, not that big a deal. Yeah, but, because uh, back back then there was only a few cameras. We only had a few good cameras to use for FPV, and we had like the TVS sixty nine, which was like a hundred and ninety dollars, yeah. which I broke like fifteen minutes after I took off. Like the you know, it was done. It was gone. Hundred eighty nine dollars gone. So it was it was kind of <laughs> kind of expensive to get started in FPV too at oh, that yeah. time. Oh yeah. So eventually, I I came into some money and I said, all right, let me just give this a try. I spent you know, I dropped like fifteen hundred bucks to get into the hobby, mm. and uh, I dropped my planes. I don't fly them anymore. I have no interest. <laughs> 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 I. I, I see people who are like, yeah, I like to fly planes sometimes, and then I fly my quads. I'm like, no. Quads, <laughs> no. quads, quads and FPV do everything I want something to do. It's, you know, it's that you get the adrenaline, you get that rush, the excitement. Planes are, you know, it's boring. I don't even want to pick them up. I got like five of them sitting in the corner. I don't even touch. <sighs> wow. So do you still long get the range, itch baby, to go back to motorsports? <laughs> You still gotta get, get the, that five mile marker, man. Gotta get that, that five mile marker. That's all I'm saying. Is you get above the, the clouds, it changes everything. I'm Holy sure. crap, dude! I can tell you that for a fact, Richard. Once you clear <laughs> the clouds, once you're sitting over the top of a cloud, you're looking down at yeah. a cloud at say 700 feet, and you're looking down at it, and you know that you're down underneath that cloud. It's a whole <laughs> other ride, baby. It's a oh, whole I'm sure. ride. I, I believe mean, 700 feet is illegal, though, Elvin. You know. uh, I don't know what that is. We don't have no regulation on height anymore, don't There's we? There's no FAA, right? Right. There's no rule. Uh, FAA rule. Let's try, go. Try, try and stop him, huh? Who's yeah. Stop him? Come get me. <laughs> Shit. FAA, uh, if you fight. give me a reward, I'll tell, his, tell you his address. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> and with quads, it's not all about all going, you know, going high and everything. It's about right, hard right, right. everything True and that. the True small that. gaps and all that. So right. you can stay right. low and still do cool stuff. Everything has its purpose. I always say that. There you go. Yep. Absolutely. There are also places where you can go as high as you want, but they're kind of hard to find. Elvin knows right. a few. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just in France for my wedding and uh, I could turn, I, I just fixed up a GGI Phantom. You could turn it into the CE mode and you can go as high as you want. You don't have a limit right. anymore. I'm not going to go cool. into uh, what I saw going to the high. He doesn't want to get in trouble. So, hey, Richard, do you ever hey, get the... Uh, wants him home. Do you ever get... Richard, do you ever get the itch to go back to motorsports or uh, does FPV give you the same rush? Uh, racing, I'm I'm totally satisfied with, with the rush I get from racing. Pretty cool, yeah. pretty cool. The competition is the same. Racing is racing. People love it. And uh, I, yeah. we're going to get into Dover eventually, but you know, we were in front of all these NASCAR fans and they're all about racing. Right. The big one ton car with 1500 horsepower or a 500 gram quad with a 12 to one power to weight ratio. Right. They saw people racing against each other. They loved it. Right. Pretty cool. All right. Although you finally ready, yeah. you're going to b- yeah, get us right busy up. for the next 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my background um, is a mix of what the guys here have been saying. I have a little bit of a technical background in electronics, and that combined with you know having done BMX racing, uh, skateboarding, snowboarding, um, and just having that thrill from racing in general was what I feel was the right ingredients for me for when I found uh, drone racing and uh, just getting hooked immediately. Uh, but before I started drone racing, I, I built my first quad for for aerial cinematography. I had a school project that I, a grad school project that I had to work on. And I thought, I was like, hey, why not fly a GoPro on a drone? So I learned how to build a, a drone with nine inch propellers, a KK2 board, um, the, the round tubular carbon fiber arms and whatnot. And I flew it like twice and I destroyed that thing. <laughs> I, so I, I never, I never put a camera on it. I learned how to balance a propeller. <laughs> um, but Most I, important I, part. Yeah, exactly. So I learned a little bit of the technical. So when I was uh, on the internet, uh, I stumbled across the Miami Lights teaser, the DRL teaser. And when I saw 
these objects moving through the stadium and going through lit up gates. I had no idea what that was. I was like, what the hell is that? Whatever it is, I want to do it. I was like, this is amazing. And then I started looking into quads. So I I immediately um, started ordering parts. I was like, I'm going to build one. And and mind you, I lived in the lower East side of Manhattan in my, (laughs) in my fifth floor walk up. This became my, my mad scientist room where I started kind of just building a quad and trying to figure it out. I still have video of my first they have real studios, yeah, my, my, a maiden <laughs> of uh, a video of a maiden in a small New York apartment. <laughs> they hit the wall it outside. Immediately. The problem I had though, was I tried to game the building of a quad having a technical background made me feel like, Oh, I could skimp out on the camera. I know what a camera does. I was like, oh, I'll get the cheapest motors. So I created a parts list of everything that was the absolute cheapest. And what resulted was the cheapest like quad you can ever put together with the smallest motors, the, the 3S uh, LiPo. I put a KK2 board on it. And I was thinking it was going to fly like, you know, so, some of the some of the better right. flight controllers, and it was terrible. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I got to fly. It felt like a bird for a couple of minutes, and then I was going straight towards a tree, Uh-oh. and I couldn't turn on time. I tried to move it, but it was on PPM on a KK2 board. It didn't react, and it just like went <laughs> right into it. Uh, that's where I started kind of understanding what it was to get you know good equipment off the bat. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. you, you can either float around and crash into a tree and have to repair it, or you can go 100 miles an hour through gates and crash and repair it too. And that's a lot more fun than just flying. It's a lot more around. fun. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So that's a that's a little bit of uh, my back background on this. We all started there. We all started tinkering and wanted to be cheap. Oh, I don't know. Not everybody. Yeah, some people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some that's people true. like I mean, expensive we all, stuff. That's- that's the problem with with this hobby, you know. I, I said this last week is that many of us, uh, you know, like like okay. Here's here's a here's a perfect point. It comes to computers. Like if I need to play a game, like I I'm, I'm a gamer. I'm I, I I I've done all the things that you've done, um, dirt bike, you know, snowboard and all that so other action sports too. But I'm I'm really a gamer. So like. You know, I can sit here all night long and sim, right? It, it's no big deal for me because I'll sit here and play Call of Duty all night long with, you know, a couple of my buddies. But if my monitor goes out, I don't have a problem with spending three, four hundred dollars, right? Bam, I'm gone to the high, to the <laughs> store to go get a new monitor. If my motors go out on my quad, uh, oh. Well, those 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 ain't twenty four dollars. Can I get those right there? <laughs> yeah. Can I get the eleven dollar special? Yeah, can I get them eleven dollar ones? They'll last long as they last me another week. I'll be fine. You know, I got to make it to another payday. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry, I yeah. clutch on my two fifty motocross bike. I got to spend two hundred fifty dollars. Right, 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 right. Nope. Now I got to spend twenty five dollars on a new motor, or a new ESC, and I'm good to go. It. 25 minutes and a little soldering and you're all good to go. Right. And everybody, everybody does it though. You know, a lot of guys talk about that. You just got to, sometimes you just got to spend the money, you know, it's not easy to do it. That's my recommendation for somebody just starting off. I start them off. Like my recommendations start them off with good stuff where I know they're going to have fun and and they're not going to be, you know, trying to figure out problems that they're having because of, Poor equipment. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah, learn how to build it yourself so that when something goes wrong, you know exactly what to fix. Yeah. Yeah, True but they, I mean, you know, this this is a technical, very technical hobby. You know what I mean? Really, I mean, you know, you need to learn. You need to learn PIDs. You need to learn how to solder. You need to learn how to. You know, you need tools. You know, you got to buy effective tools, good tools. You know, because if you buy shitty tools, you know, you'll be running back and forth. Like uh, you know, non hardened tip, you know, Allen wrenches. You know, you don't you don't buy regular Allen wrenches because they they fail. You know, right. over time. So I just bought a, a twenty five dollar C clip remover. 
Yeah. To, to <laughs> that's that's that saved, saved us. us. That saved us over. Five dollar tool, but man, it was so delightful to take a C clip off so easily and put it back right. on so easily, and it saves so much time and heartache. You know how my brother and I did it? We got we got fishing string. I think it was like 40 pound test and we wrapped it around the C clip and we pulled it with our hands to like expand it. And then we removed it. That C clip popped off the string. Never found it. again. No, we found it. <laughs> like, Persistence. But, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that happens, right? You're just going to waste right. a bunch of time. You're going to be right. upset about it. You're not going to have fun doing four motors the same way. And this happened because I went to a black sand beach uh -huh. and I didn't know that black sand beaches um, the sand is magnetic. Magnetic. Right. <laughs> so, uh, slow note, I sent him a text message from California. I was like, yo, I got black sand all over my motors. How do I get this off? He's what all do like, I do? what do I do? I wash them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. my brother. Water with the battery water, unplugged. The compressor. And um, yeah, so immediately after that, I, I bought that C-clip remover and it's just been it's so nice. nice to have. But I let people borrow tools. it too. To piggyback on that, you know, this goes into the whole science and technology, the STEM program, all that, you know, to get into this hobby, you're going to learn a whole lot of stuff. Right. You're going to learn how to solder, you're going to learn how to program, all the software behind it. Uh, back in the day, or back in the day, two years ago, it was a little bit harder. Now, you know, you got beta flight, race flight, everything set up for you. But before that, you got, you know, multi -way. you had to learn how to code in Arduino, change lines of code, all that stuff. A whole lot easier, but still, you learn the fundamentals of, you know, programming, uh, flashing boards, flashing ESCs, uh, programming all that stuff, tuning it, and you know, it's all there. It's a, it's a really good thing for young people to get into to get into the math and sciences. Yeah, that's actually what inspired my fiance, Michaela. She goes by Dead Dead to get into this. Um, this I call it a sport because I'm competitive at it. Mm -hmm. Some people call it a hobby. I right. like to make that differentiation. You know, it's fine to call it a hobby, but to some people it's like a sport. I know that that Rich is the same way. Um, uh, she got into it because we went to a maker fair and Flo, Flo took podium that day. I remember Oh, yeah? That. Yeah, you yeah, took podium that day. Uh, we went to this <laughs> maker fair and she saw all of these little kids, little boys and girls looking up to what we were doing. And she said... I want to inspire these little kids to see, you know, a, a woman, you know, building and flying her own crafts. And uh, she's been uh, doing that. The yeah, technology is the future. And to get young people into this hobby or sport, you know, once you get racing involved and competition involved, it's no longer a hobby. It's a sport. So once you get those young people into it, they're just going to fall in love with it and learn everything about it, whether it's, you know, building, sourcing parts, programming, all that stuff, soldering, doing stuff with your hands, you know, people are going to get into yeah. it and those are going to be lifelong lessons. Definitely. Since we're already on the subject, let's go ahead and change up our little uh, street, uh, you know, our timeline. Flo, why don't you talk to us a little bit about your frame so we can talk to, uh, you know, what you use to build and give recommendations on what to put on your first quad and things like that. So, yeah, give us a rundown of your frames. Hey, Flo, yeah. wait, 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 Flo, wait, wait, wait. First off, I want to know, I got a question for you. I mean, before we get into the flow frames, what the hell, how'd you come up with the design for that logo? I mean, what, what, I mean, I know the F and the R is your, is flow rotors, but I mean, where that, that, that honeycomb come from? What, what's the back on that? I mean, that, that's something I want to know. I mean, all right, I'll tell you all about it. So the whole honeycomb, uh, theme to all of my frames and all the logos and designs and all that uh, came from my engineering background. I did a lot of material science stuff uh, and knowing all that, I know that you can save a whole lot of weight while keeping the durability of materials by cutting uh, material out in the right places. Right. And obviously honeycombs, not only in nature, but in technology, uh, these days, obviously, uh, a honeycomb, you can reduce weight while keeping that strength. So right. everything about the flow rotors frames is about to be lightweight, 
but also keep that durability aspect to it. So you can crash this thing over and over and over again, not only save your frame, but also save your components because right. that's going to save people money. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks man. Too. I really appreciate that. That was a good answer. Good logo, though. Good logo comes yeah. out. I thought he just liked like, honey. Like every time I see it, <laughs> I, I like, like honey too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think about bees, I guess. Tell us never goes anywhere without a hat. I always know where he is. I just see the yellow t- honeycomb right on his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> I got sweat stains in this thing, though. That's right. <laughs> All right, give give us a rundown of your frames and like the yeah. philosophy of each frame. Yeah, so uh, all of my frames go around trying to save weight, to save obviously, weight obviously, but, but the weight, the weight isn't is in the, the entire, entire thing, thing because you can yeah. add a couple grams to the carbon fiber. It doesn't make a difference because our four motors, uh, you know, each motor puts out like 100, 1,500 uh, grams of thrust. So a couple extra grams isn't going to do anything. It's all about the thrust that you get from those motors. So you want to be able to maximize that thrust, not waste any of it, but also keep everything strong so that when you crash into a gate or crash into a concrete wall or into a parking lot, because there's a lot of night racing in parking lots nowadays, I'm going to break your frame. And not only that, but you're going to save your components because the components, uh, you know, if you crash and you break a camera every single time, that is going to add up. You know, you're going to spend a lot of money on that. So everything's about protecting all your components, not just your frame, but also the components but keeping it lightweight and maximizing thrust so you have the, you know, the advantage in a race or in freestyle, you get all the battery power that you can get without wasting, you know, uh, milliamp hours. Cool. So what are your frames? So uh, I started off the first big frame that made it was the Hive 210. Uh, that was actually, I believe, you know, two, two years ago, I believe was the first drop down top plate frame. So what it did, not only did you have a, a good center of gravity, uh, you know, horizontally, but vertically as well. So you got the most, the, the heaviest part of any drone that you're going to race or freestyle with is the battery. You know, yep. everything else is light. carbon fibers, light, the ESCs are nothing. The motors are kind of heavy, but you know, everything else is light. you're going to have a frame up the all-up weight is going to be you know around 150 200 grams and then you're going to add another 100 or 150 grams of the battery so why not bring that battery down make sure that you got a good center of gravity top to bottom as well uh i tested that out for a while and realized hey you know what this thing flies a whole lot better than anything else i've ever so i kept with the lower battery uh getting the center of gravity good all around and uh, also keeping the durability. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. What else you got? So after the Hive 210 came out, people really started requesting, especially in the Safety 3rd team, once uh, racing started to come about, about a year and a half, two years ago, people started racing against each other. Not just the freestyle frame. So I came out with a Roosh. Uh, the Roosh, uh, there's an X. A configuration where all four motors are e- equidistant and there's a, uh, a a lengthened version or the l version the five l. where the front motors and the back motors are further apart than the side you know from side to side yeah when the whole race flight crew came out and said you know what this thing flies really really good around corners uh you don't lose altitude or anything uh when you're punching out 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 of a corner you got both configurations and what that is the Rouge compared to the Hive 210 the Hive 210 was very very durable it had really thick arms four millimeter frame uh mono plate with a drop down battery all that the Rouge is more of a, a racing style frame where you can swap out an arm if you break it because you know especially the four especially the five millimeter arms you're never going to break one of those but uh you what what that allows you to do is decrease the width of each arm so that not only does it save weight, but like I said before, the carbon fiber weight is absolutely nothing. So if you save a gram or two, it doesn't mean anything. 
but the thin arms is going to allow you to get the most thrust out of your propellers. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And less resistance. Exactly. exactly. So is there anything special you're working on that you want to give the audience a little hint on? Well, I uh, just recently I came out with a smoosh and smoosh. it's kind of a funny story how we came up with this name, but you know, we kind of uh, took the roosh and smushed it down. <laughs> smoosh name came out. Uh, we took the yeah, roosh out of stock. frame just like design. You know, out of stock. As yeah. you know. like, yeah, out of stock. Like, yeah, it's hard to, over. It, it's hard to keep it in stock, especially with everybody carrying it now. But uh, you know, there's more orders on the way all the time, so everybody can get one. But uh, what what that allows you to do with a smoosh is you have the roosh racing style frame with these strong five millimeter arms, but you also get that drop down battery on top uh, that the Hive 210 had uh, with the skinny arm so you don't lose any thrust. So from my experience the past few years of doing this, uh, every quad flies better with the battery on top. You corner yes. better, you can tune easier, you don't have to up your eye derivative of the PIDs, because uh, you can always tune a quad to fly however you want. But when you up derivatives of that PID too high, then you lose other aspects of the flying characteristics. Sure. So the lower battery allows you to tune it a little bit easier, uh, not have to raise that eye derivative all the way, and you can fit a GoPro and a battery on top and be able to fly both freestyle and racing. I think it helps for both the battery on top. And I think both of these guys here with us will uh, agree to that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I fly top, top mount battery when I race too. I, love it. I like it. I like it on the top. I, I used to, I used to fly <laughs> with a <laughs> bottom mount lipo and every photo I post spook. Um, our other teammate would comment sometimes just one, a couple of words, lipo on top, <laughs> lipo <laughs> on top. And he'd always, so, I finally tried it, you know, because Spook would always tell me that that was a, a better way. And, uh, yeah, I haven't gone back. People hated battery on top for a while. They're all, all about these tiny little frames where you couldn't fit anything on top, especially if you right. had a GoPro on it or an action camera on it, uh, because you just couldn't fit it on top without the propellers hitting everything. And, you know, batteries are the most expensive part of your quad. So battery moves over a little bit. The battery or the prop strikes the battery you lose $30 in one crash. So everybody started putting the battery on the bottom and they said, you know, when you crash, you flip over the right way, all that. Well, whatever, don't crash. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> the battery on top and the GoPro on top, done. that's going to give you the best flying characteristics, not only for racing, but <clears throat> especially for freestyle. It's... Oh man, I kill lipos. Now that I have my lipos on top, I destroy them. But I honestly <laughs> would rather destroy a lipo than have a camera crash and get shoved all the way into, you know, your flight controller or other components that make it extra difficult to troubleshoot or repair. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a give and take, right? Yeah, I mean, but, it's easy to replace a battery, but it's not easy oh, to yeah. diagnose a problem when something crashes into your flight controller or your receiver and you don't know exactly what wire you got to yep. fix. You got to troubleshoot every every motor or every ESC or then it goes down to the flight controller or the PDB, the power di distribution board. You know, you don't know what is wrong and you got to do like four hours of work just to find out exactly what went wrong. Yep. That sucks. Yeah. It's always better to build a new one than it is to try to troubleshoot an old one. That's just a fact. <laughs> <laughs> just, just throw hey, it away. That's, that's exactly why I just take it, to, take it to completely take it to apart. the garbage. All right. To the next break. So this brings us to our next topic. So Richard, we're gonna let you yeah. talk now for the next sure. half an hour because these next, two will go forever. I don't know. I don't know if I can keep up with Aldo. Uh, you probably. I could. didn't even get to the three-inch frames yet. Come on. Uh, you can get <laughs> to, You can hey, get to those you know, later. <clears throat> To be fair, after we had that big battery discussion, we didn't. Nobody pointed out the fact that with the Roosh, you have the option of top or bottom mount. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. Say it that does. I. It does. I mean, it does. It has strap holes both ways. Both ways. I like that. I like. <laughs> you that. like it both ways. <laughs> okay, so say I've ordered a nice new flow rotors frame, and I'm new to the hobby, Richard. 
what would you recommend to the person that's just starting out? What what kind of components would you put on your nice new floaters frame? I would, um, well, I mean, I have to say T-Motors, right? <laughs> you're right, right. right. <laughs> if you don't, you're in First, don't, don't. Hey, Hold on. Okay, let me, bring up, let me bring up this question. How about this? Give me your specs for a beginner, and then you can give me your specs as a racer. Okay? Oh, yeah. So you I, could... I, you know, I, I think they're not going to be that different because, you know, like we just said before, even as a beginner, you're going to want quality components. So, you know, I I personally I personally feel like, um, you know, 4-in-1, a good 4-in-1, maybe Akon or one of those new Hobby Wings, one of those would be, you know, ideal. Um, I personally love uh, Furious FPV's Radiance because it pairs – so well it's f3 but i don't i don't know they have a nice that 14 is nice too but i'm still i don't know i still like the f3 boards and it pairs so well with a four in one because it's you know it's it doesn't even take up a full whatever square mm -hmm. it's like chop chop down so there's hardly anything to it and um what else the, the nice thing about four in ones and that whole fc pdb four in one combo is that you don't have all these wires running around everywhere because they're props the props are going to break. The props are going to bend, especially now because you got these indestructible props. They bend. They yep. cut your wires. You short things out, and you're out for the rest of the race day. True enough. The goal here is to have a frame or a quad built that can last the entire race day on a Saturday or a Sunday or whatever, whenever you race. You want to be able to just take it in, you know, be able to get back out for the next heat rather than just throw that quad out and get another one out because then people are going to have to get four or five quads ready for a race day. It's better just to have one so that, quad or two quads, you know, maybe a backup quad, but one that's going to last you the whole time. Definitely. That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. Cause since I've been flying Roosh, I'll bring, I'll bring three to a race and this whole season I've never had to fly back up. Wow. That's and actually I, I could, amazing. And I crash hard. I crash hard. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I try. I try and design these things yeah. to protect your components, not just the durability of the frames, mm -hmm. but also to protect all you know, eighty percent of the money that you put into this quad, which is the the electronics. So you know, fixing replacing an FC is, you know, to the experienced solder might not be difficult, but you know, it's time consuming. You're going to take twenty minutes to unsolder twenty wires, put a new one on resolder those 20 wires and then flash it with everything that you had on the old one so you don't want to break an fc you don't want to break the wires in between you don't want to you know the receiver has got to be well protected you don't want anything to go bad on a race day definitely That's true. Definitely. as we know from multi-gp everything goes a four one after the other you can't you don't have any Sorry. downtime with multi-gp racing you know <laughs> you get you get disqualified if you're 30 seconds late. That's so right. you got to have everything ready and working all the time. Definitely. Yeah. So I personally I feel that the four one is, man, is, uh, it's saying. a little more advanced than than having you know individual ESCs. Um, the reason why I feel having a four in one ESC is more advanced is because when you have people that are first starting out, they they don't know when a motor has gone bad, and if you start trying to accelerate on a bad motor your ESC is going to catch fire. Um, it, it's hard to, to kind of diagnose that. Like if you were flying on a, on a, on a damaged propeller and that off balance started heating up your motor and your motor's uh, enamel started frying, you probably wouldn't see that. So I'm the contrarian here. For a beginner, I would recommend having individual ESCs on arms. Um, and then after, you know, you have experience with that for a while, then I would say go on to getting the four and one. Um, Rich and Flo here recommend the four and one because they're no longer beginners. These guys are seasoned pilots, these right? Guys are advanced builders, and these guys uh, race avidly. Um, so that's my thing on it. I, I agree with you though, because uh, you know four the ESCs yeah, back in the day used to burn up all the time. Even if you had a bent prop, you know you'd pull so many amps that the ESC is going to break. And now the technology has gone so good in terms of, you know, the drone market. Uh, they made ESC specific to this stuff that, you know, they have kind of a leeway if that is to happen. Uh, for beginners, I would recommend 
don't cheap out on, on, on stuff. Get the high quality motors, high quality ESCs, because even if you have a bad motor, or bad prop, that ESC is going to be able to handle it. Bad motors are going to, like Aldo said, you're going to melt the enamel off of, or the glue off of the magnets and your motor is going to go bad, all that. If you have a good quality motor, good quality components, they're going to last through crashes. They're going to last yeah. through two, three, four, five, six race days. And you're not ever going to have to repair these things. So. And if you do yeah. break a, an individual ESC like at a race and you only have two backups or just one, with that individual ESC, you can you know replace it there on the spot. Um, yeah, as absolutely. opposed to a four in one. If you fry that four in one, you're probably not going to have enough time to do all of the soldering and the replacement of it. Right on the spot, you're definitely not going to have enough time. Yeah. Or if you don't have, you know master soldering skills to replace caps and uh you know oh chips on the board and er everything like that you know some of us do some of us like doing that but it nope. takes time and it takes precision and it's not even worth it so yeah i cannot replace a cap wait. i've tried so many times was... wait a second Flo. what are caps capacitors i'm, I'm joking I'm jo <laughs> i know i know i'm joking i'm joking because i've never used them this is, this is me right here. Right here. This is me. Oh, there you go. Right. oh, yeah. That's nice. There you go. There you go. The old He's man wearing glasses. his like, uh, magnified but, spectacles. Yep. That's right. Nice. Do you have a light in the front? Yep. Oh, that's cool, man. Nice. nice. Yep. So, actually, the, 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 the biggest. The that. <laughs> <laughs> Flo's trying to keep us on track over here. Right. One, right. one piece of advice that I'll, get to, uh, that I'll give to beginners is. Sure, learn how to solder and everything, but get a good soldering iron because you're going to be using oh, it all the time. Definitely, it's soldering yeah, iron is so that's, important. That's, get that's really get a very I, don't don't buy a. I I, I will say this because I I was just on this rant, you know, about a month ago. You know, don't buy one of those soldering irons. You just plug in the wall, and it's home. You need something that switches on. And it's variable temperature. Yep. And yeah. I, because a lot of guys, what they do is they just plug the soldering iron in, they walk out of the room, they come back 20, 30 minutes later, the soldering iron is like 950 degrees. It's melting. Yeah. Yeah. The <laughs> handle is the, <laughs> the handle is shrinking because all the oil is disappearing from out of it. You know, and it's gray and the top of you know, the table's about to crack. Anyway, but well, let me make a quick public service announcement right here okay. to all the ESC manufacturers. Stop using the high heat solder on the ground wires and start using the low heat solder for everything and silicone wires because people don't really know silicone how to solder wires. all the time. Yeah. So if you put the soldering iron too hard or too long on the wire, you're going to start melting the, the uh, casing. Yep. Yeah. So start using silicone wires and use the same solder all throughout. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, I, I would advise uh, noobs to look into the temperatures they're supposed to be using also. You don't want to have 400 degrees Celsius on a tiny little pad on your flight controller. Right. You're going to open it and stay up for three it. minutes trying to get it. Yeah, trying exactly. It. <laughs> and at that point, your ESC is so hot that you're going to start moving around components that shouldn't be moving around. And you're going to short some things. You're going to break a motor immediately when you plug the battery in. It's not even worth it. The caps are just going to fall off. Just yeah, I've done that. Pants fall off. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's what... yeah, try to use one of them 300 waters trying to get some wires off of something. You probably have one of those soldering oh, wow. irons that has like a pistol grip. Yeah. With the two connectors. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good luck. I'm cutting now. <laughs> All right. Anyways, back to drone racing. Back to right, drone right, racing. Right, All right. right. Although, back to drone racing. Ha have you have you already uh, finished your uh, components list for beginners and what you like to use, or do you have more? Then we'll get to uh, um, flow for over beginners here. individual ESCs because you probably are not going to have a lot of quads ready, you know, on the flight <coughs> line for backup. For, for um, um, <laughs> like uh, Pete Ghost, uh, the Australian pilot for Multi Star, uh, good buddy. He brought like great racer. Know, was it like ten quads, ten, ten, um, ten bolt quads, and and he destroyed like every single one of them and was repairing every night. 
Yeah, a lot of noobs, a lot of new people don't have that luxury. So get the individual ESCs that you can replace. Um, I would uh, get something with replaceable arms because you will replace the arms. You don't want to have to be doing transplants all the time, you know, like all of your motors and your ESCs and whatnot. Um, until recently, actually, until just last night, I have just gone into my first four in one ESC. Dun, Congratulations. Dun, dun. Congrats. Um, <laughs> and this was lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, because, like I'm a racer. Like I, I designed like my own ESC protectors here. I have one right here um, that has a reinforced prop strike area. And the other side is flexible. So I can replace it like in two minutes on the spot at a race. Yeah, you don't have um, to unmount it to solder the point, you know, the solder points off. You don't have to unmount it. It's like right here. I just flip it open. I pop it out. I replace it. I, um, but I, I came to a realization that I no longer burn ESCs. I'm destroying my ESCs now because of prop strike or crashes. So I know that I can disarm quickly enough so that my motors aren't running on dirt, you know, drawing amps and my ESC is going to fry. Right. Uh, I know now when my, uh, craft is wobbling too much where I know I damaged the propeller enough to, to destroy my quad. Um, so I don't run into those issues anymore of lighting up ESCs on fire. So I feel confident enough to jump into a four in one ESC and it's sandwiched between my VTX and my flight controller. And I'm not, I'm not going to create a fire in this really expensive stack. Uh, but for, for new people, I would recommend, um, you know, ESCs on every arm, and you find a lot of experienced professional pilots doing the same thing. No, um, I'm I'm totally with you because I honestly don't necessarily like four in ones because you could be flying one for two months, three months, everything's great, and all of a sudden you didn't even crash hard or whatever. But that four in one ESC loses one side, and you got to replace fifty dollars worth of ESCs, and it's not even worth it. And you don't know why it happened. You don't even, at that point, you just replace the four in one. You don't even troubleshoot anything else that's wrong with your quad, whether it's a motor with a slip magnet or, you know, motor with uh, uh, dirt in it or, like Aldo said before, magnetic particles. <laughs> that, oh, so God. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, for beginners, I would recommend getting like a simple camera like the HS 1177. It's an inexpensive yep. camera that's proven. Uh, 600 lines of, of video transmission, so you have very low latency. Uh, a lot of experienced pilots get that as well. Uh, I would definitely recommend a good VTX, like the TBS Unify Race. Um, that one is a little difficult to change the channels, but once you've mastered it, it's not too difficult. A lot of the races now require 25 milliwatts, but if you're going to be flying on your own, uh, doing some freestyle, going behind trees, whatnot, you know, bump it up to 200 milliwatts, you have that luxury. Uh, what else? Um, getting well, propellers. What's that? I have to agree there, Aldo. Unify yeah. All. Yeah. Getting propellers that, um, that are durable, that aren't going to snap on you. Um, there's a lot of propellers that if you look at them the wrong way, they're just going to crack. <laughs> gonna... Yeah. Even with a bent propeller with the new ESCs that are 30 amp, you know, at peak, they can probably withstand 50 amp. Even if you have a bent propeller and you crash into the ground or whatever, you can still get back up in a race. And, and, you know, even with the vibrations, you can race through it, but you're not going to ruin your components because you know that your components are going to be able to handle that. Yeah. Um, I use the XSR Free Sky Receiver because it has telemetry, which I use for the smart audio so that you can then change your channels and power output from your controller. Um, right. That changed my life. Uh, I have been on the flight line and I realized that I just picked up my backup quad and I hadn't set that one up to, for the right frequency. I can do it from my flight chair. I just asked the race organizer to give me an extra 30 seconds and there I am on the right channel. Um, what else? Uh, those are my top recommendations for. No, for, that's uh, really good. And I would add um, for motor selection. 2300 kV range so it's not just it's not super crazy you have a you know like a throttle a throttle curve that you can control better definitely yeah, yeah honestly unless you're racing on a two mile track you should get more torque than top speed yeah you want to I be agree. able to pull out of those corners as fast as possible you're going to make up the most time in a race uh in those short distances rather than you know the straight away 
you know, that's the straightaway is only a third or not even a third, an eighth of the racetrack. It's all about the gates and making turns out of the gates. You want that low end. Absolutely. Yeah. Race, yeah. race, I definitely won in the corners. See what else. So, so that, that speaks to the craft itself and the ability that the craft has, but now getting the pilot connected to this is really important also. Uh, so that means the eyes and the controller. For the controller, I've been testing out the FreeSky Q, QX7. Yeah. Q7. Right. Yep. Something, something to that effect. And it's been really good. And at MultiGP IO, uh, I saw a lot of seasoned pilots using the same controller. And that's like a very entry level controller. It's only like $105. Right. So it's been proven to work in a race environment very well. Any Anywhere bigger or farther than a race, um, I, I couldn't speak to that because I only race. Uh, and the goggles, make sure you have a good module because if you can't see, you can't fly. Right. Um, I've been plagued with problems with with being able to see from my goggles because of bad modules or the bad goggles, um, both when I first started and just uh, the beginning of this year. I had I had a bad module that we just bought, and we bought two of them, one for my fiance and one for me. Her video was always fine. My video was always terrible. And I always thought that it was my quad. So it pushed me to the edge of buying a clear view system. <laughs> and um, it, it was never my module. I mean, it was never my my goggles, it was never my quad, it was my module. Yeah, right. for, for the beginners, uh, definitely don't skip out on the video components because you, as good as your quad is going to be, if you can't see, you're not gonna be able to fly well. Yep. Uh, if you have a VTX that sprays out all different channels, uh, you're gonna one. You may get kicked out of some races depending on where you race. But uh, two, might get hammered. You're, yeah, you're gonna get a ton of <laughs> static. Go that way. <laughs> you want to make sure that your VTX is outputting that channel only, and that you're getting the clearest video that you can. Because the clearer the video, the better you're gonna fly. Yeah, the more fun you'll have. And the more natural it feels. Because if you have really crappy video, it doesn't matter how good of a pilot you are, you're pretty much just flying in in darkness. And yeah. I, I I will say this: I think I think that the newer guys have it easier today because things oh, yeah. work so much better than they originally did. And like, like you know, I talk to people all the time about like they go, "Dude, how the hell you fly?" You can fly through all that noise. You know, there's some places I fly that, you know, it's inevitable. It's coming. You see it you, you as you get toward that corner of the field, you're going to get swamped. And you either fly through it or you don't go that direction. But you got those Jedi skills, Alvin. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Jedi skills, I, 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 like I do that. say you have to learn to use the force, you know, but, uh, Absolutely. you know, it, it, that's a big part of FPV until we get, you know, that uh, digital video stream. Locked, locked. Because yep. digital is either it, everything from fifty percent is great, and then anything below fifty percent is nothing. So with digital, and that's how it is. But what I'm saying is that um, things have things have gotten a lot easier. A lot things work cohes a lot better than it used to. And like you guys were saying, that a ground system, your ground station, your videos. You know, you want to get a big, good video transmitter. You want to get a good camera because if you get a shitty camera, it won't change light. And and really, I'll I'll be real quick about it. But the the difference between a shitty camera and a good camera is a good camera is going to respond from changing light shades from bright to dark. It's going to respond like that. Yeah. And, and on, uh, on that note, camera, get a frame. Get a frame that's going to. Uh, protect those components because <laughs> electronic components as soon as you crash that crashes you know it's a lot of force those components on top of that board inside of that camera or inside of that vtx those are going to break eventually or they might eventually. work for a little bit they're not going to work as well and not right. only are you going to ruin everybody else's day because you're spraying out <laughs> in terms of vtx you're spraying out different frequencies but right. your camera is going to start to not working as well. Those components are very susceptible to, to damage with crashes. So get a frame that's going to be able to protect those things so that you can use them for much longer. 
Right. Definitely. And one of the okay, so uh, on the race director <laughs> side, and if you been, if you follow Multi GP International Open, you kind of know the story already. But VTXs are one of the few things to where you affect everybody else racing with you. That's why there's so much talk about getting good VTXs because bleed over does affect other people. That's why a lot of people say get a good VTX because just because you have good video doesn't mean the guy next to you will have good video if you have a shitty VTX. That's why it's really important to have that. And also smart audio, definitely look into that. That's a game changer. Yeah. It's the biggest game changer in racing in a long time because it's so easy to switch channels with that. Yeah, I'll say that the VTX is probably the most important part other than the receiving antenna on your goggles because it doesn't matter about the transmitting antenna. As, as long as you have really good receiving antennas, you're going to get good video. But if you have bad VTX, and that's the problem with racing these days, I know two years ago in Nationals, they you actually paid a higher price to get in, but they gave you a VTX, and it was a right. brand new VTX. So you knew that you weren't going to be spraying on, on everybody else. And that's something that's got to be regulated in racing these days. you got to make sure that everybody that's racing in your heat has the not, not necessarily the same VTX, but uh, the same quality VTX. So You, you was at Nationals? Uh, 2015? 2015, I was not. But I heard very, many, many, many stories about you know, people buying $11 VTXs off of, uh, online. Thank and you. as soon as you, they were great, but as soon as you crash them once or twice, yeah. they're not great anymore. Yeah, we, we, we did get a VTX. I got my VTX in the mail, or, you know, and then they gave, they gave us a bunch of VTXs when we got there, but it, it, it was, you know, it, it was 2015, you know, and, and really that does say a lot. I mean, it was two years ago. So video, video issues today are not the same issues we had i mean they, they are the same issues but they're not as severe not as bad because you know? the quality right. of vtx is all across the board has gone up right yep but still, I, would, I would say i would say where they were like when you got to the field it was if there was a hundred guys out there with vtx's uh 80 percent of them work today it's more like a hundred percent I don't know about 100%. That's pretty hard. But I, I can okay. tell you. I There's always that one guy that you want to kick out of the race day. Flo speaks the truth. And, hey, all I'm going to say is that uh, I talk to a lot of race directors, and you will see the downward plunge into 25 milliwatts and as an enforceable racing uh, milliwattage uh, in the near future because it's just heading that way because people right. get tired of – getting bad video it's just if everybody's got a clean good quality 25 milliwatt vtx everybody's gonna get great video but as Dude, soon as one person far. has something that starts spraying or they crash too many times and it's not protected that vtx is gonna ruin everybody's day i mean you can really go far on 25 milliwatt if you got a good spot absolutely so. especially good receiving antennas good yeah. receiving antennas definitely all right let's go ahead and move on to the next subject Never. otherwise we're going to be here for four hours, even though it would be kind of fun for four hours. But some of us like to sleep. Let's talk about Dover. Let's talk about Team Flow Rotors and getting up there and doing some great racing in front of a great audience of a thousand people. Aldo, how about you? Trip up. Uh, okay, so we took a road trip to Dover. We got to <laughs> our Airbnb. <laughs> and there was a dog in our Airbnb, and I'm allergic to dogs. By the way, it was like 1 a.m. and we see a dog inside our place. <laughs> a big, freaking white, wolf-looking dog. It was huge. So, um, yeah, we got in and then we took care of that situation. We started charging the packs and then we drive out to... Uh, wait, wait, wait. What, is, what does take care of that situation mean? Did you oh. bury the dog? <laughs> uh, we just uh, flew our quads outside and you just chased them for hours. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I was going to go with a more dramatic story, but Flo went first. I can't, I wasn't, I wasn't we won't get into that. that. <laughs> uh, yeah, then we go to um, to where they had the NASCAR event the next day, and I was pretty blown away, man, uh, seeing the way they did the setup on in the parking lot area of the Miracle Mile. Um, uh, I, I guess you call that the the area the fan of, zone. The, of the venue, the the fan zone. The that's fan what it's called. 
um, it was really cool. It was really cool to see these enormous gates. Um, we were ready, man. We had charged up our lipos the night before. We had uh, practice flying around the, the parking lot of the Airbnb because it was really big. So we had some obstacles we could fly around there. And then the, the event started. We, we, um, we cl- quickly saw uh, how many people were not prepared for this type of race. Uh, I was somewhat prepared from having listened to other people's uh, races that require a pit stop. So I did as much research and planning like on my own prior to that. Uh, but when we got there, I, I don't think a lot of the pilots uh, did that. Um, so I don't want to give away all our secrets, but uh, you know, Aldo came up with a super heavy-duty double Velcro from the battery to the frame so we can do quick pit stops. Everybody ended up copying us, but you know, we were the first to do it. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so let's talk a little bit about that, um, about some of the preparation that I did. Uh, I, I listened to some podcasts where... Uh, I believe Team Big Whoop, it was, had a race that required some pit stops. They had to do like countless amounts of laps. And in this interview that I heard, I heard them mention that they they went away with using the Velcro strap to strap the quad and, you know, tighten it and like strap back down uh, with the lipo because that took too much time that they ended up just using Velcro by itself. So I looked into finding the strongest Velcro there was. And it wasn't Velcro, it was actually 3M dual lock tape, uh, which uses the the interlocking uh, pieces, but in 400 by 400 count. And this was more expensive than- Magic mushrooms. Yeah, magic mushrooms. They, it costs like 40 bucks for 10 feet. And that's what we ended up using on our quads because it just locks in there and it holds it tight enough because we felt if we crash, we've already lost the race. So let's right. not crash and let's make the pit stops fast. Now, one of our friends from Safety Third Racing out here in Jersey, he told us pit stops win races. And I took True. that to heart. I said, we have to make the pit stops as fast as possible. And what's the next biggest component of a pit stop? Communication with your pilot and your navigator. So I said, obviously, we got to have some walkie talkies. You know, I don't want, I, I don't want them to try to, decipher what i'm trying to say with my hands i don't want to have to yell uh across the way and maybe them hear the wrong thing i'm trying to say so then we got the walkie talkies the next thing we did is we created a a a code word which meant go because we felt that all the other pilots were going to be saying go 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 yeah like the pilots next to us were going to say go we didn't want our pilot to think that that was for him and chop up the hands of one of our pit crews uh hey, so that's, hey, hey that's good good th- thought process right there yeah yes. so we wanted it to be fast but also safe uh so our code word was harambi for the flow rotors a uh, three inch quad the harambi <laughs> there's yep. your plug uh, flow see look you finally got that plug in <laughs> there you go yeah there was <laughs> the three inch quad the harambi and uh, that's how we organized it we prior to that uh, i had thought well what's going to be faster i said a hot swap so I parallel soldered another XT60 next to this one. So we could plug in one LiPo, disconnect the one that's discharged, toss it, and pop the other LiPo back on there without the ESCs having to go through a cycle, without the flight controller having to go through the cycle, without the, the VTX having to power off and power back on. I had planned this prior, but it ended up being that that's how we had to do it at the race anyways. So, so um, Justin... Hegarty was handing out a bunch of uh, uh, parallel sure. connectors, but we already had our soldered on. So it made it very simple, very easy. It was already kind of like, like uh, heat strung together. It was, it was a, a sweet setup. Um, and then the next part was that we were all going to have our lipos on top to make it easier to swap. And when we came in for landing, instead of hitting the beam bag, which might cause a propeller to bend, which might cause other damage with, um, or battery to disconnect or battery to disconnect which we saw some 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 of those situations happen we came, we slowed down we leveled it out and we slid on the concrete so we'd slide it in you know kind of like you do at a parking lot and um that's the that's the extent of the pit strategy really 
worked really well. I mean, you had some great pit uh, pitting times throughout the, uh, I don't know, three days. Was it three days? Yeah, it was three days. Yep. And yeah. so talk to me uh, about the racing. Did you enjoy actually racing three laps and then pitting? Was that fun for you guys? Did you know it was completely new to not just me but all of us? Uh, we had never run a race where we had to stop, swap a lipo out. And at first, we were like, you know what, we could probably run 10 laps on one lipo, we yep. don't need to swap this out. But we were trying to uh, get this to uh, you know, more of the NASCAR style of racing where you got to come in, pit stop, change your tires, change your or fill up your gas tank, all that. Um, and in the end, we really, really enjoyed it. And it added a whole nother level of competition to the racing that nobody was accustomed to. So in the future, if that becomes, you know, uh, part of the racing, I'm all for it because it not only is it on the pilot, but it, it's on the navigator next to the pilot. It's on the pit crew swapping the batteries. Uh, the pit crew is, can't only be one person. It should be two or three or four people because they got to communicate and they got to do work at the same time. Definitely. Yeah. And True that. I would say, I think you were right. I think three laps was actually too small of a lap count, but by the time, <laughs> you know, we figured that out, it was too late to change. You just can't make yeah. a last minute change like that. But I would agree with you. It had it been like eight laps and then another eight laps. I think number it one, the crowd would have been. enjoyed it more. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And then, and then you get to like the bottom of the lipo where people can't even, finish a lap they got to come in that doesn't necessarily have to be eight laps and eight laps you know depending on the size hey. lipo you use you could go six laps and and come in for a pit and then finish it out yeah i, 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 I disagree I because my my ass would be black uh, than a tire <laughs> you know I mean, i'm just being honest i mean you guys talk you about eight laps. motion you wasn't in that damn heat. <laughs> it was hard enough to finish one lap inside of that uh, cage. <laughs> yeah. Lord Jesus, it was hot. That, that race was fun. It was uh, challenging. Um, the challenging part about it was you have these huge gates, which makes you want to go fast. Right. But you have an invisible ceiling. Right. What is that net? You can't that see that through your, through your goggles. You yeah. know it's there. Yeah. You don't want to accidentally hit it. So. Yeah. Having to fly with that in mind um, was challenging. It was fast. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I saw a lot of people get stuck in that net. I saw a yeah. lot of people trying to do the 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 over under yeah. obstacle and clip the top of that gate so many times. I saw a lot of quads get destroyed with that steel. And, that, and they that, had there. that was that was more of an obstacle, uh, uh, a visual obstacle. You know, like if you. If you just flew it like you were supposed to, you never even noticed that it was an under and over. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, because it was you, about you, uh, two two feet. Right. If you if you was looking at it like walking through it, going, "Oh shit, this is gonna be a pain in the ass," right? But really, you know, like um, because it, the track is on, you know, uh, lift off and uh, a couple of other places for Sims, right, Richard? It's the the Dover track. Yeah, they put that in uh, a couple updates ago. They put put in all the. They actually made all the all the objects, so it's all nice and scale now. Right, right, right. So like if, when like last night I was flying that racing with one of my my uh, multi GP guys up here, um, Corey, and uh, we were racing it, and like he was like, "Holy crap, this would have been so much fun!" And I was like, "It was fun," and it was, I was like. I, I don't like I ran into the I said right here is where I ran into the gate. I mean the under and over in, in the test flights. And now that I've flown it like nine times, it would it, I, I would have gone a lot faster. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know we hit a couple metal gates ourselves and so yeah. did everybody. But yeah. guess what frame did not break a single time that weekend. <laughs> oh. And guess which team did not have to swap out a single camera or single VTX, single FC, you know, it's all about the durability of your frames because you're right. going to be racing around stuff that's going to break your stuff. You sure. protect those components, you're going to keep going all day long without having to spend 20, 30 minutes between heats fixing your stuff. You can, you know, sit down, relax, catch your breath, get ready for the next heat rather than spending, you know. I didn't break a frame, but I shattered. <laughs> like, 
one of my motors exploded. <laughs> yes, yes, it did. It, well, I won't talk for motor company. Motor but. so hard that that magnets inside multiple just like shattered. Shattered. Yeah. yeah. What did you expect the frame to break if you hit something that I, hard? I hit a metal pole straight on. The frame was fine, but you should have seen the metal pole. <laughs> <laughs> and just to the audience who wasn't at dover we were over concrete these were metal oh, you know yeah. very strong heavily metal construction and uh the netting hung up a lot of people and caught a light bulb on fire too so like right. it was uh right. it was definitely a very challenging environment for uh for equipment because uh towards the end there was equipment failures that determined who came for second and third. So I'm yeah. just saying. on that note, that's, what's great about the uh, FPV racing community is, you know, you, you pop a lipo and you run out of lipos or you, you break a motor, you go over to the tent next to you and everybody's more than willing to give you whatever you need. You know, they're very, very friendly, very helpful. They're going to tell you what to solder on. They're going to give you replacement parts. And it doesn't matter if it's $25 or $100. They're going to help you get back in the next heat, even if you're racing against them. Yep. True enough. All right. So we talked all good about Dover. So tell me what your challenges were. Although, come on, you, you had to have challenges at that um, race. What were yours? I think they stemmed a lot from the surprise that a lot of the pilots had when they arrived at this event. Not understanding what the pits were, not understanding... Um, the format of the race, not, not having been prepared, it started getting a lot of pilots flustered. It started, the emotions started running high. And when that starts happening, it kind of just like spreads into like everything. So uh, the, there was a lot of, uh, how would you say it? Nerves. Nerves and, and, and disarray flustered. because of that. Um, flustered mentalities. Yeah, there was a lot of flustered mentalities. So there was a lot of emotions running high. Um, I mean, racing is racing. Minutes turn into seconds and hours right. turn into minutes. So, I mean, you, you can imagine that at, at a very well-organized race, you already have these emotions running high. You already have pilots that are, you know, the nerves are kind of ramping up, the adrenaline's there and whatnot. Add that to not really quite understanding, you know, the format. Add that to being at a very hot event. Add that to seeing you know, snowmobiles and motorcycles <laughs> doing backflips <laughs> on the other side of your – of the other side of the course while you're trying to sit there and race. That was one of my problems, man. Um, I had never been at an event that had so much stimuli around me and seeing like I have DVR where I'm looking on the flight line, getting ready to race. And there's like a, a snowmobile like flying, like right up above. And then like a motorcycle doing a backflip. I'm like, how the fuck am I supposed to race? I want to watch this. (laughs) 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 Um, So I I got a little shook up in some of my heats, which was um, new to me. Uh, And I think that happened to a lot of pilots there. Yeah, it's true. How how about playing to the crowd? I mean, we had a few hundred, maybe up to a thousand watching you at one time. Give you the jitters. That was so cool. That was so cool. I, um, that's why I understood why they did the three laps and the pit. Uh, it, it was for the crowds. It was for the people to see these quads come up really close and whatnot. Uh, at one point, Flo and I went out to interact with the crowds, and we started sharing our goggles so these people could see this. And when they got to see what we saw while other pilots were racing, they, they just lit up in excitement. And yeah. it kind of just it opened them up to something they hadn't experienced before. And they, were just they had no idea what it. we were seeing. Yeah, they had absolutely no idea. Once they saw it, they were ecstatic. They said, "This is actually what you're seeing right now. This is incredible. It's a 3D version of on-road racing." Definitely, and it's a lot of fun. But uh, going to you, Flo. Um, besides, you know, racing on that day, what were your takeaways for uh, the Dover event? Well, you know, there's a lot of high quality or high, you know, really really good pilots there uh, from all over the nation even from abroad, you know, people from Mexico, people from Europe came over. Uh, it was the, the, the competition was very, very high and everybody had to adapt to that. And there were so many people there that you, you had to ad- adapt your style of racing to be able to race with everybody around you, not only inside the cage, but everybody behind you, every pilot had, an- you had to be able to tune out of everything and tune in to what actually counted. Um, the other thing is, you know, 
we would have given them a show if there was no roof on top of that net and we could do a little freestyle action between <laughs> heats. Uh, people would have loved that too. So back, back to what I was saying before, maybe an hour ago, the freestyle should definitely become part of all these big time uh, events. Cool. So like moving forward is uh, team floater rotors. Are they, are you guys looking for, you know, team racing events or just trying to get it, go into competitions with the whole team just to be able to have a group there and representing team float team or your company? I absolutely. definitely want to. Yeah, absolutely. So as, as of now, I think IDRA is the only um, group that has incorporated uh, team racing as opposed to singular you know, pilot racing one on one on one on one on one because there's usually five or six people at a time. But if you can incorporate the whole team into it, not maybe not just through pit stops and having a, a pit crew and navigator and all that, but you know, making a point system, um, sort of like uh, not motocross, not NASCAR, but there's some races or even in the Olympics, you have teams competing against each other. Uh, the whole team aspect of things is is really beneficial to the whole competition side of things. Um, you can have how did they, how did they, uh, in the Paris competition, they had team racing there. Every all the whole team raced at once, and then how did that work out? Was it the first one to the finish, or did the, did they get points based on? I think it was first first one of the team to finish was was the winner, right, for the whole team. I'm not sure. So oh, okay, I'm pretty uh, sure. Yeah, it was it was four against four and two teams at a time. So whoever got to the finish, you know, three out of three people out of one team could crash out. As long as one person made it there first, the whole team wins. Let's go to Paris, Rich. That's do right. Let's Dude. do it. <laughs> that looked like a great race, but uh, that was one of the Yeah. <laughs> well, you yeah. Just, I would just continue to power loop those things rather than hit the gate. But, uh, <laughs> I will say this, though. I hope there is more team racing in the future. And Dover is going to happen again. They have a three-year contract. So hopefully uh, we'll see you guys up there in uh, 2018. Oh, we'll be back there next year for sure. Uh, look, look at that. Uh, hopefully so, there will be no dog in the in the Airbnb room. But, you, know. <laughs> you guys are planning to win all of it, right? You're going to have your uh, strategy down. Oh, yeah, man. And, uh, we had to make a comeback because on qualifying day, we, we took first place, right, Flo? Yep. Yep, yep. Yeah, so on qualifying day, we were on it um the the day of the finals it's racing you know things happen things happen nerves all that you know the 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 crowd all that crashing it's it's racing so anything can happen you can be the worst team and come up in first you can be the best team come out in last and yeah team platinum misfits they were fifth overall in qualifying and they won it all which surprised everybody yeah exactly I, they got the fastest lap time, but I believe we got the second fastest lap time. Unfortunately, it was in qualifiers and not in the finals. But you know yeah, that's how true. racing works. True you, you guys, you guys had a little incident. So I mean, what took you guys out was shitty. It was, it was, you know, I mean, really, it was like, ah, what? Yeah, and at the time, you want to, you know, you want to get in a fight with the person that took you out. But you know, in the end, it's racing. So yeah, it's, it's it competition, and you got to. Take what you get. So sometimes yeah, you just can't go around like you know some 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 race car drivers and be punching people in the face and stuff. <laughs> and, just... and that gives you the drive to practice more. And yeah. especially if team racing becomes a thing, you know you're going to practice more as a team rather than an individual pilot. Yeah, and you're going to get better and better and better. It's only you know this this hobby, that especially racing, FPV racing, is only you know not even a couple years old. So. We're going to grow from here, and it's going to turn into a really good thing. Right. I agree. Definitely. I agree. That brings up a good point. You guys, uh, when you had Jed on, he talked about how important it is to learn how to fly through gates with other people, just chasing people. Talking right. about how, that's, how he, that's how he learned and stole Gab's lines and ended up winning. Right, just right, right, right. Yeah. And, and, and you, good thing you noticed that because he actually told what he was doing. Like yeah, I, th- I chatted I was, with him yeah. a- after, you know, and, you know, he, he actually was telling everybody like what he was doing. He was watching. If you listen to the whole thing, he was, he was watching he was, Gab's he lines. Was, he was, yeah. He was watching so that lines. he could record them and lock them in so he yep. could, he could chop them up. 
That's what yeah, you see somebody pass you through a gate 90% of the time, you're going to hit that person. Right. And not that you wanted to, but your eyes went from the entire, you know, uh, environment to right. just that quad. And you're like, yeah. Oh, I don't want to hit this quad, but all of a sudden, boom, you hit that quad. If you fixate, that's what they're well, looking at. That's what they say. If you fixate on anything for more than two seconds, you're going to run into it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's just, 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 you know, your, your, your mind is locked in on something and it's hard to, it's like those people that act, you know, the cops that get hit on the side of the roadway when they're helping somebody, you know, you're, you're, you're driving by and you're looking at the car and you just slowly end up sideswiping the cop car. Mm-hmm. That's true. Ouch. Good Never point, done Richard. That, but... you, got an, you got anything else you want to <laughs> add to that? Uh, I was just, it's, I just, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what, what Elvin does when his, you know, when he's driving, but. Yeah. <laughs> You're trying to hit cops, right? Yeah. yeah. No. I have uh, a couple of those in my family, so watch it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one special thing about Richard is he's been able to take the simulator side of things and apply it to the racing, uh, the real life drone racing. So back in the day, or you know, eight months ago, when simulators were all new and they were terrible, and you had lag and the flight characteristics weren't all that good. You, know, you couldn't really apply what you did on the computer. Uh, I, I can't speak for myself. I've never been a big simulator guy, but some people are. And they can, they're can they able to apply the skills that they learn uh, behind their computer screen and all that to real-world racing. And those racers are surpassing everybody else these days. They get so much more practice, and they're able to – take what they get from behind a computer screen and apply it to real world racing. As, as long as your quad is tuned the same way that it is uh, virtually. Yeah, that's important. I, I, it's nice that they added beta flight um, type. It's not, you can't really tune PIDs in there, but you can set the rates. I have the rates in, in liftoff and Velocidrone set exactly the same as I do on my real quads. And it's switching from one to the other is, it's, I hardly notice the difference. Not only is he, is he a great racer in, in real life with a quad, but this dude kills it in the simulators. You're like, how is this even possible? Hey, DRL, they, they have a place for you. You know, you get into the top I'm, eight. I'm, and, uh... I, hey, I'm, I'm, ranked, I'm ranked in the top 19 on some of those. Some of those. Nice. I would toot my little home. <laughs> Good luck catching <laughs> Richard. I was going to say, I'm, I'm like you. I you know, lose a whole day. Yeah. Losing a whole day. Okay. So Richard, uh, between liftoff and velocity drone, what are the differences and which one do you like better? Um, I'm it's, it's depends which ones had the last update. It seems like <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's this whole hobby. Which one had the last update? That one's better. It happens so quickly yeah. in this hobby. Yeah. But, um, you know, I go, I kind of, I go back and forth. Right now, I'm favoring liftoff, but um, I just actually tonight I jumped on and with some of the safety third guys and jumped in Velocidrone. And it was really cool to to fly the Roosh in the sim. It feels it feels awesome even flying in the sim. Nice. And that's the cool thing about sims too. You can you know you can be a hundred miles away from people because people drive hours to go to races every weekend. Sure, so to get together and race real drones, but in a simulator on a Monday night after work or Tuesday night or whatever. You can get together, call up a couple of buddies, and be like, "Hey, let's have a race," and everybody gets online. And now that the sims are up to date with you know the technology that the real drones are at, you can actually have a real competitive race against everybody. Not only just have fun, but you know have a competitive. Absolutely, yeah. When you um, when you get a good group, a good group of people together who are you know who are going fast and and pushing hard, and, you know you have a little you know a little banter or whatever, but when you when you're when you're hitting your lines right you know it's it's almost the same rush as the real thing not quite but it's really close and you, i still get i still get nerves i still get you know adrenaline and you know it's it's just a really cool experience to to uh you know to do that i've well, you know that, I've, that's made, a- I've actually made a, lot of, I made a lot of friends through just through camaraderie of flying with them and and you know i always try to encourage people to you know, to do better no matter what their level is yeah. definitely it's, uh, to, to it's, back that point up aspect. to back that point up as soon as you put the goggles on in real drone racing 
you lose sense of time, you lose sense of uh, speed. Uh, you think you're going slow, but you're actually going 100 miles an hour. Uh, it's it's what they call flow state. Uh, nothing with my name or anything. F L O W. Uh, <laughs> Flowstate.com. Copyright reserved. 2017. Yeah, flow <laughs> no flow state. You know, you lose sense of uh, uh, your surroundings, where you. Uh, your brain actually processes information faster because you're in the zone. Uh, that's a better way to put it. Flow state is being in the zone. So, and it's actually a, a chemical thing going on with your brain releasing endorphins and all that, where you make decisions fast. Your you you, uh, you your reaction time is faster and all that. Uh, behind the sim, once you take off and you start racing, it's almost exactly the same. I agree. Man, you, really you, just, you just gave me an excuse to get out of some housework shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, so they say, you know, you can get flow state through a number of things, especially through action sports and all that. Mm-hmm. But people get into this flow state uh, working behind a computer at work because they love what they're doing, right. uh, you know, playing whatever sport you're doing because you just love what you're doing. But as soon as you put these FPV goggles on, it's an immediate entrance into flow state. You lose sense of time. A two-minute battery pack feels like you're in the air for 10 minutes. You have, you have no idea how fast you're going. You're just in the zone. And that's the most surprising thing that I saw when I started doing FPV, not just racing, but flying and mm-hmm. freestyle and all that, just messing around in the park by myself. Uh, you just enjoy yourself. Definitely, yep. definitely. It's it's a lot of fun to fly with other people, def- and to make it easy like that because it's online. But uh, Richard, I do have a question for you. Like, yes. If I just installed either Lift Off or Velocity Drones, what are your recommendations on first things you want to oh. do before you actually get in there and start pounding out some laps? Uh, first, obviously, you want to calibrate your controller. They they're pretty good about that now. Either one, they it's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, after that, uh, it depends on the sim. Velocidrone is a lot easier to start up because you just pick a frame and you can fly. You can, you know, you can adjust the camera angle on the fly. You can, um, it has all the menus pop up while you're in the race. You can change your settings, uh, change your rates, uh, change some of the flight characteristics with different, um, you know, drag coefficients and, and thrust and props and all that. Liftoff is not quite as beginner friendly because they, they make you choose components and you have to go into a separate menu to the workbench and then you pick a frame and you pick your motors and you pick mm-hmm. your props and you pick your batteries and you, all everything. And it's, you know, it's, you don't really know what's going to do what. So there's a, there's a little bit of time where you have to sort of experiment and whether, you know, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. You can, they do have blueprints. You can pick the frame and just fly the way they give it, you know, the way they give it to you. But, um, I I I try to go ahead. I think these simulators are, are going to become, if they haven't already a whole nother side of this FPV hobby slash sport, because, you know, with everything with esports, you know, I've been big into sports all my life, and now esports is coming around, and you get a hundred million people watching an esport game, just like the Super Bowl. It's crazy. But if you can correlate what you do virtually to what you do in reality, uh, it's one is going to make it easier for you because you don't have to crash and break stuff and repair and all that. But two, you're going to get better. Uh, on the computer and then you can if you if the simulators are good enough you can take that from the computer and apply it directly to the real world uh racing drone and you're not going to lose any you know sense of uh uh, reaction time and all that everything it's so good nowadays the simulators especially you know think about a year from now two years from now the simulators are going to be just as good as you looking through the goggles in real time racing. So it's kind of unreal uh, to me that you can get that sort of uh, correlation between virtual and reality because in the end, FPV 
sure, you're doing something in reality, but you're looking through goggles and you're relaying in a video. So it is kind of virtual. It's to me, it's like real virtual reality. Real virtual reality. There we go. <laughs> it, like it does. Yeah, it definitely blur, blurs the line between uh, reality and esports. What? It, yeah. Uh, but and and with you know with changes that are coming, are, liftoff. So what? Version zero point one zero. <laughs> Dude, they're so never going to finish. One tenth of the way developed. No, <laughs> no. And they've been out what two? I think almost two years. They've been out. Two now. years. Two years. Yeah, I've had it since it yeah. first came out. Well, eventually they'll finish, oh. and then uh, I can't wait for version <laughs> one. <laughs> I might actually pick it back up. I actually haven't touched that in a while. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like everybody else. If I'm gonna go fly, I want the real thing. But exactly. if I was a if I was a real racer, I would probably pound out on the Sims too because stick time is stick time, and uh, right. if you can get it similar to what your racing drone is doing, then uh, hey, you can't beat that. It's uh, it's always practice about experience. Practice as long as it's the same. Right. As long as long as it's practice, it's not. There's a difference. I want to say there's a difference between just flying, you know, and then there's a difference between going out and with a, a thought process. Practice it. Practices really practices when you go out and you say stuff like, "I'm going to go out today, and I'm going to practice my figure eights, or I'm going to do funnels around poles everywhere I go," you know. Those, that's yeah. practice. When you just yeah, go, you go out, out you... throw a pack in, that's not practice. No, that's just you're just out having fun when you do that. But right. yeah, yeah, when you're you're running drills or right. I'll, I'll there's watch. nothing wrong with fun. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> practice, there's, practice, there's, practice. There's no fun allowed in racing. Oh, uh, <laughs> hey, you know what? Here's the thing, though. Richard Half is right. Would be if it wasn't no, fun. no, Richard's You're right. right. When you start going up against the uh, world class pilots, especially at Dover and all these big events like the multi GP championships and everything, you know, you're you have no chance if you don't practice <laughs> against people that are better than you. So right. it's true. It's tough. And if you're not on your you know, like for me, like before before I go to a, a race or whatever, a big race, you know, like I sit here day after day for like four days, guaranteed four days before I leave to go anywhere. I'm locked into the sim and I'm just sitting here. So, Fingers, I, I didn't got all the nervousness, all the shake out. You know, I'm all about let's just get it done, you know. And um, so practice, you know, that's my practice. That's trying to warm up. That's trying to be prepared to perform and do the best that I can. And if you're not ready, you know, you haven't been doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, and, and on top of that, that's my call to the sim companies. You know, I'm not a big sim guy or anything, but I know that if you're rained out and you're stuck in a house and tiny right. whooping around for two days and you go outside and try and race, you're, it's not going to go well for you. So as long as it's the same virtual and the same reality, then that's practice. I like okay. that. Definitely. Hey, you know what? We we will see because competition's only going to get fiercer in 2018. It's going to be even it's tougher. To, and it's hey, you know what? I mean, like in uh, multi GPIO, right? Uh, it wasn't American that won. It was uh, Australian. So it's going to be, it'll be interesting and, and, once all the Europeans. And some people are upset about that. The ding on, you know, damn, it's like, man, look, hey, if you earn it, you earn it. Doesn't matter where you come from. Yeah. And you better practice because the younger generation has faster reaction times than we do. So, yeah. Right. They are crazy. Yeah, it seems, it's like, it seems like, it seems like every other week there's, you hear um, some new 12 year old kids winning all the races. Right. <laughs> true it's but very that's, true i mean that's 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 why there's an age limit in nascar <laughs> <laughs> oh that's me okay that's me all right <laughs> we're gonna start wrapping up otherwise we're gonna be here for another hour and i can't have that so i'm gonna um, ask you guys I'll do it. Well, yeah i know you do it uh i'm gonna start wrapping up by asking you uh one last question which is where you think all of this is going so i want you to rub your crystal ball and where you think you know, it's going to be going in 2018. Richard, why don't you start us off? I'm going to make you talk for like half an hour, I swear. <laughs> oh, man. All right. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I, I, I don't know. From what I'm hearing, it sounds like it sounds like people are really embracing team racing. You guys had um, Pro Aerial League on here. 
Was yeah. it just your last show? Right. Yeah, they had the TV. They they they're doing a really cool um you know, focusing on teams. They've got they've got their teams, everyone's assembled, they're committed to the whole season. They're naming them like sports teams trying to get trying to get people involved that yeah, way. I think Alpha Team Outlaw next year, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> but I I think I think on that on that same thought, I think I think the real push is trying to find how to engage an audience in a in a you know how to really hook them because you still get people going to multi GP events which are awesome for pilots it's awesome for the people involved but uh, you know spectators that aren't heavily into drones don't really know what to do with a, a multi GP event I, I I still think that the the you're going for teams you're going to have to let the attitude of the team come out, you know, like, you know, personalities. Yeah. 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 Definitely. You got, you gotta, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have <laughs> to let the team come out. Like, you know, there's a lot of guys running around right now, you know, like I was just having this conversation with somebody who was like, Oh, oh what, you guys interview people. What's it like to be interviewed? I'm like, I'm fucking terrified. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, just I, don't had know, to I don't know what I should say, what I shouldn't say. I don't know if I should go this far down the road or if I should stay <laughs> back. You know what I mean? Because you're yeah. scared to scare the hell out of people, right? right? But if I'm out in a room with four other guys and we're bouncing at uh, you know momentum and, and attitude off each other, we could we could become an entity that is <laughs> egoish, something that people want to follow. Right, entertaining. Right. It's going to become right. less individual and more team based because right, that's right, right. get the audience's attention. And right. DRL is doing it right because they're portraying drone racing to the you know the the crowd out there that has no idea what drone racing is all about. Sure. To that watches DRL on ESPN or whatever it is, Sky Sports, they absolutely love it. They're like, I want to know more about this. I want to see what they're seeing. And mm -hmm. I think they're doing it right. Uh, if you have an individual competition, then you know people might not be as engaged. And it's also on the race organization to be able to show the spectators the pilot seat. Because sure, they'll in terms of team racing, they'll see what the the crew is doing. They'll see this drone flying around at 100 miles an hour around the track but they don't actually understand until they see what's behind the goggles. So right. it's, it's all about the organization of these races. Definitely. Uh, what else do you got, uh, Flo? Is, uh, what does your crystal ball says besides uh, team racing? Anything else that you want to add? Well, you know, racing is racing has always been around, you know, from BC to now, you know, whether it's horses or cars or motocross or whatever, now drones. Uh, racing is racing. People are always going to be competitive. People will always want to race. Uh, but there's a whole other side of drones as well. You know, uh, like I said before, the freestyle will love that stuff. And I think, you know, look at the X Games. The X Games blew up because of this whole freestyle thing. Uh, sure, uh, Grand Slalom uh, ski racing has always been around and people love that too. But look, you know, pipe and uh, uh, you know, all of that stuff, they, they love it. They love people taking, they like to see people taking risks and getting things done. And if they crash, sure, they crash. But they like that competition aspect of risk. Um, I think, uh, and I'm not going to go into the whole aer aerial photography side of things because obviously that's blowing it up on its own side. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you say drones or quadcopters, people usually go towards the aerial photography side of things. And you have to explain, no, I have a little drone that goes 100 miles an hour in 0.6 seconds. And I'm racing against five other people through gates and tunnels and around flags and all that. Uh, I don't think enough people know about drone racing yet. That's I true. think it's to, it's it's on the race organizers to show what drone racing is all about and you know more of these companies getting on television and on the internet and streaming and all that uh for example safety third uh let's say eight months ago or last season started live streaming their races mm -hmm. and people started tuning in all over the place whether it was twitter 
or, uh, you know, uh, Instagram live, you know, all that stuff, Facebook, uh, people were getting in on these feeds and they saw a whole different side of what these drones can do and what this technology can do. Even if they don't know all about the soldering and the programming and the software and all that, you know, they really enjoy the racing aspect of it. Definitely. And it's one of those things where we'll be progressing and hopefully freestyle does get a little bit more say into it because it is really popular. It's a major part of the sport that really does goes unsung and unsaid. But uh, we will see if uh, somebody will pick up that mantle in 2018. It's hey, been a- some of the some of the most fun times I've had in an event. Not it's not just the racing against top quality pilots, but it was uh, that minimal group of pilots that got into the freestyle event, uh, competing against each other. Not just competing, but fueling off of each other. You know, like you see somebody doing this one trick or whatever you want to call it and everybody's gonna that and they're gonna try and dive something higher closer to the wall go through a smaller gap and community as of now is very friendly towards each other and they fuel off of each other's vibes so i think that has a big part uh not just racing but the whole freestyle and drones for fun Definitely. Yeah, my uh, my crystal ball says the same thing as these guys said. Um, spectators, it's it's all about the spectators and bringing them in. Uh, we see a lot of people doing it in different ways. Uh, DRL is doing it by creating these huge productions, and they're they're getting spectators, you know, from ESPN and whatnot. Um, but multi GP and these live events also need to cater to spectators, and we see things like uh, what the Paris Drone Festival did. They partnered with a company called Vogo Sports to have an application where spectators can go on the app and see what the pilots are seeing from the app. Yeah. Now, not a lot of people know about this, but this is some technology that is you know, nascent, and it's going to be hopefully becoming more and more popularized. It's big in the equestrian world, but now it's making it into FPV. So how do we get that type of technology into races like uh, the ones that we have at the New Jersey uh, Safety Third Racing um, teams, like at those events. We have a, an amazing venue at the Loreto Winery, and we have races while there's food truck events. So there are thousands of people already there. We have bleachers there. But when we have the those spectators come to watch, seeing these little drones in daylight going the 100 miles an hour that, that – mentioned it's very hard to see we do have a monitor there where people can can watch and we do have it uh, broadcasted live but it's still missing some elements that make it easier for spectators so in my mind i'm seeing drone racing becoming more more production um oriented there's going to be more cameras there's going to be more ways for for spectators now, now this isn't 10 feet away in the future this is like maybe a hundred feet away in the future. Um, having people be able to follow the race and follow their favorite pilots from a, a second screen on their palm. Um, yeah. We're going to see these, these drones get bigger and possibly faster because there's a lot of excitement in knowing that these crafts are bigger and can fly faster. We saw team big whoop uh, experiment with their, their X class. Uh, what was it like four weeks ago here in red hook, New York at, one of the the, Formula e. the FE racing events. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of these little bits of the future kind of glistening here and there. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of time where some, some third-party investment companies say like, okay, hey, let's get all of these pieces and combine them together and start some, some, some yeah. different types of racing for spectators. And on that note, the technology is there. Now, I'm, I don't want to give away any of our, you know, business ventures that Aldo and I talked about at Dover, but we walked around and we saw during the NASCAR races, you know, people and especially little kids asked their parents to buy or rent out this unit where they had, you know, a tablet in front of them, a handheld device where they got to see not only the entire race, the NASCAR race, but they got to see inside of the car and see exactly what the, the conductor or the driver sees, or in our case, the pilot sees. 
And on the side, they have you know the standings, one, two, three, four, five. And they can click on every, anybody's feed and, exact, and see exactly what that driver is seeing. If we can implement that technology, which is already there, to drone racing, because we're, we're, we're transmitting a frequency, we can easily be doing that onto a tablet or whatever. Yep. So if everybody has this tablet and sees they pick their pilot, their favorite pilot, or they want to see the person in second place or whatever, they can tune in to that pilot's feed and see live time is going. Um, the technology is there. I think we just need to implement it to drone racing. And I think drone racing is becoming so big and uh, uh, becoming uh, so so fast, you know. It, it from a year ago, there was no drone, big drone races where you could have spectators look at. Just like 2015 nationals, you just had a bunch of drone pilots, but you had no spectators. 2016 mm -hmm. in New York, you had a bunch of drone pilots, obviously, but you had a lot of spectators as well. But they could not see anything unless they had, you know, a little watch with an FPV uh, monitor on there, or they had goggles themselves. Uh, if you could, you know, if you had a company to distribute these types of devices for spectators to watch, uh, I think it would blow up immediately. That's tough because that's a lot of equipment to go uh, to foot up front. But I agree with you. Uh, and and we also video. have problems on our own video frequencies at five point eight. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. So. But later on in the future, the price of this technology, you know, drops down. The the implementation becomes easier and easier. It just takes those a few big steps to get there and then the the, the um, manufacturing processes will will follow suit and things drop in price well that's the goal and i am one to hope the same thing and you're right because like uh what i, I was just talking to this i don't remember i think i was at io or something but like ishin literally has a diversity goggle set that's 35 dollars yeah. I mean, I can get people to buy thirty-five dollar goggles. Okay, exactly. Right. So, all day long. All so, day long. So it's getting there. It's getting to the point where it's like, hey, we'll just buy ten of these at a time. Eventually, we can outfit like a crowd of fifty with these goggles, and then let it spread from there and stuff like that. You know, it, right. I, I definitely crowd see of it. Thousand and ten thousand and up. All right, now you're thinking crazy, but no, I like the idea. I'm not crazy. Hey. I, I would love to see a crowd of 10,000. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah, that, Dover was that, close to that. Well, just to actually see racing, just drone racing. Yeah. It's like, uh, we'll get there, hopefully. I like I liked the energy. I like the mentality. All right, but I also need to go to bed, so we're going to start wrapping up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're on the West Coast. Come on. I'm on the West Coast. He's oh, on the West Coast. Coast. I'm on the yeah. East Coast. It's like uh, 1130 right now. So we're going to go ahead and start uh, – getting some contact information out of these guys. So, Richard... Wait, people, wait, 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 What? Wait. Before we shift into that final phase... Okay. I, I got I got a couple questions for you guys. Go. What do, you, what do you think in the market needs to change? Uh, I well... Think in the market needs to change. Any, anything. Just less junk. Thing, though. Less junk. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Less junk. But uh, throughout the, through the past two years, I've also seen the junk go down in numbers. So you get a lot more cheaper components that are also very good, just as good as the high-end stuff. Sure, the high-end stuff is going to be a little bit more balanced in terms of motors, propellers, all that. Uh, the ESCs are going to be able to handle more amps, all that. But not just the components, but like we were just talking for the past half hour, the spectatorship. We got to get the spectators involved with racing if we want the drone community to evolve into, you know, what we all expect it to be uh, a real racing community. No, that's a good point. Uh, more product focused towards the spectator, not towards yeah. the pilot. I agree. Right. That's definitely a good point. Anybody else? Point. Um, yeah, that was a good one. Me, me personally, selfishly, I'd like to see seven millimeter carbon fiber. Not that I'm, I'm working on it or anything, but you know, <laughs> that's a hit. I don't know. I'm good, <laughs> but um, I'd, I'd like to see 
I like to see new. I like to see people experiment with the format of racing more. You know, yes. instead of just just. I think I think with timing systems, a lot of clubs have timing systems now. A lot of chapters have timing systems, and it's and they're I, expensive. I they are, but I I think the whole <clears throat> number of laps in two minutes is is getting a little. Not that it's stale. Racing's never stale, but I'd like to see you know like Korea does does three lap races and you're done you know they have a, a decently long course and the races are under a minute so you're not you're not you're not fighting to conserve your battery you're flying as hard as you can for three laps and whoever to the finish first wins and you know what I batteries are going to only going to get better in the future Absolutely. so you can start adding on laps you can do a 10 <laughs> lap race you can do a 20 lap right, race. right what, whatever it is something reasonable where you still have your peak performance and just run it as hard as you can and really see yeah. what people can do with that. I'd like to see some of that. Break more stuff. Aldo, what, what do you got? You, Aldo? Uh, I think I want to second what Flo said. I, I want to see more spectators at this event. So I want to see uh, a really, really strong push by the manufacturing companies to start thinking of innovative ways of involving spectators. You know? uh, I think that that's going to fuel the racing and in the racing it will fuel their sales so i think it's an investment that um a lot of these manufacturers need to take i agree Roger. it's it's That's one of those right. things where uh race directors need to actually carry products for spectators at the event that's hard though trust me i understand this it's hard yeah there's a lot of investment up front to do that what else yeah. you got elvin that's it. I mean, that's that's a good question. Uh, you guys answered it, and 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 I don't want to stretch why out too long um, tonight. <laughs> any more, any more than we yeah, are. yeah. You know, he's he's put up with us. He hates hang out, you know, because it's the we're working on West Coast time right now, so it's all good. But we're working on it. So anyway, <laughs> but thanks guys for coming out. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Um, it's always fun to chat with you guys. And, yeah, thank you guys uh, for having us. It was uh, really great meeting you guys in person at Dover and and seeing you why at um at the Multi GP International Open. Uh, I want to I want to thank Flo and Richard for being awesome teammates and and the awesome sponsor. Right back at you, and you too, Flo. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, hell yeah, guys. You guys are the best. All right, but before we wrap up, we need some contact info. All right, yeah. Richard, if people want to follow you, reach out to you, talk to you, where can they reach you at? Um, probably, you know, Instagram is probably easiest. Just uh, rambozo.fpv. Rambozo. I like that. Rambozo. Flow Rotors. Okay, here's your chance to spew the rest of your frames and also your contact <laughs> information. Go. Uh, I'm going to say oh. Flow Rotors. Uh, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook, all of that stuff, floaters.com. You can go uh, check it out. Check out everybody's videos, pictures, not just mine, but everybody that's sponsored, everybody that buys my frames. You know, I repost stuff all the time. So it's all one big community. Everyone's friends. So I'm very, very happy to include everybody into this team and, uh, and repost all their stuff, make sure that everybody's out there and try and build the drone community for sure. Cool. Aldo, what do you got? Uh, my Instagram handle is where I publish most of my flying and and weird antics. <laughs> Dude, I uh, knew you were going to say antics. Awesome flying. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Telus period one, O-N-E. So it's Telus one. Um, yep. Pretty Some cool. And like for you guys who don't know, you should definitely – to see pictures of TELUS's uh, multi GPIO team because they were by far the best teams because they actually had females, <laughs> three very attractive yeah, females. Yeah, we were Team PB and J, peanut butter and jelly. It um, yeah. consisted of Marty Flies, uh, Simon, uh, Drone Doll, Megan, and a couple of our other friends, Bryce and Katie. Katie is actually um, a sister to to Mr. Tiny Whoop himself, Jesse P. Uh, and my fiance Michaela, dead, dead, and myself, and we we did a team race there. It was fun, and they had females there, which is like, in I feel bad for them because there's like 300 <laughs> males and two females. It's really bad. 
Anyways, it was great seeing you guys there. Yeah, it was great seeing you too, man. All right. We really appreciate you guys coming on. And we definitely need to split you guys into individuals to get on the podcast because you guys have a lot to talk about. It's right. hard to try to fit like all we of you talk talking about things. Yeah, I'd be honored to do. Yeah, nah, it would guys, be you great. Guys like, you know, we have fun. Yeah. That's all it is. Well, it yeah. is a lot of fun. And we definitely will talk again. But until next time, we're going to be cutting out. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I'm going to go. Thank you, guys. You!